how to get rich. This is Libertarian View, your source of decentralized and distributed information. Economics is a science that studies how people exploit, generate, distribute and consume scarce resources. But what are scarce resources? Well, a scarce resource is any resource that is available in an amount less than the will of all people to have that resource. Almost anything is a scarce resource because we humans almost always want more of everything. An example of a scarce resource is the beachfront land in Leblon. In case you didn't know, Leblon is a district in Rio de Janeiro full of rich socialists. It has a nice, relatively clean beach of about 800 meters. This is one of Rio's most expensive addresses. Many people would like to live on the seafront in Leblon. But no matter what you think of it, there is a limited number of people who can live there. There are many more people who want to live there than what is allowed by physics. Two bodies cannot occupy the same place at the same time, and this determines that ultimately there will always be scarcity. An example of a non-scarce resource is air. We humans need air to live, it is a fact, but it is also a fact that once our basic need is satisfied, we have no need for additional air. Nobody wants more air than they normally use, and so far the amount of air available is adequate. Note, the scarcity of a good is not a permanent quality of the good in question. It is an attribute derived from the quantity of that good, the human interest and the ability to obtain such a good. An asset can become scarce as a result. There was a time when land was not scarce. Before the invention of agriculture, humans were hunter-gatherers and saw no interest in having more land. There was land for everyone. Land was not a scarce resource at all. This changed with the advent of agriculture. Likewise, it is possible that at some point in the future, air will cease to be abundant and become scarce too, due to new uses or population growth. Economics is a large area of human knowledge. There are countless questions that are posed, discussed, some with already known answers, many still to be studied. But let's not kid ourselves. Everyone's biggest concern is just one. How to get rich. Okay, this title is almost a clickbait. This is not a get-rich-quick course. This is also not quantum coaching, but yes, let us address the wealth generation topic here. That title was just to get your attention because, well, you know, the viewer's attention is a scarce resource that all YouTubers are looking for, isn't it? And yes, everyone wants more from scarce resources. That is the concept of wealth, having many scarce resources under control. There are, of course, people who want to get extraordinarily rich. Others just want to have a comfortable life, to be able to live without too much turmoil, to provide an equally comfortable life for their children. But with very few exceptions, nobody wants to be poor. That is, some really want to be rich, others want to be just a little bit rich, but nobody snubs wealth. Wealth is practically synonymous with human will. Adam Smith was the first to consider wealth an important part of the economy. In fact, economics, according to Smith, was wealth-centric. Smith defines wealth as equity. Patrimony is the name given to everything the person owns, which includes land, housing, goods, money, food. In short, all the things you own constitute your patrimony. Equity is what is left if you subtract your debts from your patrimony. Note that wealth does not necessarily have a monetary value. It is just a set of things. Adam Smith defined the true measure of a nation's wealth as the wealth of the people, not the wealth of the king, nor the wealth of the state, I would add. Although this definition is still common sense nowadays, there are in fact several problems with it. One of the raised issues is the so-called common good, or welfare. And what is that? Is the notion that your wealth depends not only on the things you own, but also on the things other people own. For example, imagine you might have a big, beautiful and comfortable house, but it's located in a dirty and dangerous area. 
Violence and insecurity are not on your property. They are around you, on other people's properties. Now compare that to having the same house but in a peaceful, wooded, clean neighborhood where other people's properties nearby are safe and well taken care of. Your property is exactly the same, but of course the second scenario is much better, so its monetary value is going to be fundamentally different. How well you live does not depend just on your property, it also depends on the property of other people around you, and even, to some degree, on the property of everyone in the world. This view, defended by some other classical economists such as Alfred Marshall and Arthur Pigo, understands that wealth goes beyond one's patrimony. And you guessed it, that is where the notion of a welfare state, in which the government with the vision of wealth justifies relativizing private property to ensure that everyone lives better in general, comes from. The libertarian criticism to this point of view is just that a consensual solution would be far better than the coercively imposed solution. Sure, if you want to live in a good neighborhood, you will have to pay a maintenance cost for that, policing, cleaning, that is the cost of living in society. But this cost does not need to be coercively imposed by governments, nor does it need to be in the form of laws and taxes, because that is in the interests of all parties. But of course, governments love to give the welfare excuse to justify their existence. Here we refer to wealth as a set of things, but it is clear that wealth either defined as a private property or as a private property plus welfare can be monetarily quantified. Not precisely, exactly, but as an approximate, accurate indicator. And this is where we get into the problem of absolute value versus marginal utility. When Adam Smith proposed his theory, his view was that things had an intrinsic value. He understood that the market could make a house price go up or down according to supply and demand. However, for him, there was an intrinsic value not dependent on the market price of the house but on the cost of building that house. The cost to build a house measured in labor would be the intrinsic value of that house. This view of absolute value leads to absurd ideas such as Marxist surplus value. Marginalists soon realize that things have no intrinsic value. If you invested millions to build a mansion besides a slum, that was just a bad choice of yours. There is no intrinsic value distorted by the market because the only value that exists is the marginal utility of choice. Someone who has a certain amount of money available will only exchange their money for your house if they think that the personal, subjective gain that they will have by owing that house is greater than the equally personal, subjective gain of saving their money or spending it in other things. So, if we have a form of money, a well-established currency in society, we can measure the marginal utility of a good by its market value. Note that estimating market value is simple for things sold day by day such as beans or cell phones, but it is more complicated for things that are rarely trade. The only way to know the value of your property would be to actually put it up for sale and see the highest value someone offers for it. No matter how much you think your property is worth, it only has that value if someone agrees to buy it for that amount. So there comes a solution for the definition of wealth, either defined as private property or as private property plus welfare. The market value. Selling a mansion in a great neighborhood, one could make more money than selling the exact same mansion in a slum. The market itself is responsible for quantifying the common good, as well as any other attribute of the property. You can ultimately define your wealth as the sum of all the money you could make if you sold everything you own and paid off all your debts. But from an economic point of view, wealth itself completely loses relevance when we think of marginal utility. It becomes merely the consequence of how much you inherit from your parents, plus the sum of the decisions you make through the course of your life. Even if you start from scratch, if you make good decisions throughout your life, you can build up some wealth. If more than that, you were able to make optimal decisions very often, you can end up rich. Here's the answer to the question that names this video. My view 
is that making great decisions throughout your life and ending up a millionaire depends much more on luck and being in the right place at the right time than on some kind of personal ability. But I believe that it is especially important that we seek to make good decisions. This is within human capacity as a matter of fact. Just do not mess everything up. Making good decisions, even if it doesn't make you a millionaire, can actually lead you to a comfortable life. And that's pretty reasonable already. Making wrong decisions is inevitable. At one time or another in your life, you're going to screw up. But if you learn from your mistakes, don't repeat them, and you will already have a big advantage. Those who do not learn from their mistakes are doomed to misery. Those who learn from their own mistakes can do much better, but the ideal is to be able to learn from the mistakes of others. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, quote, you can't live long enough to make your mistakes all by yourself, close quote. Doing that, you don't have the cost of being wrong, but you still get that lesson for free. You just need to be a good observer. Economics has shifted its focus from the study of wealth, as Adam Smith defined it at the beginning, to the study of people's choices and how society, through these choices, allocates a scarce resources, which is how we define it today. And how can a decision, a choice, generate wealth? Could it be that when I buy something, there is just an exchange? For example, when I go to a car dealership and there is a car that costs, let's say, $20,000 and I have $20,000 in my bank account and I decide to buy that car, this means that now I have a car and the dealership has $20,000. No wealth was created here. Nobody got richer, right? Wrong. Nobody buys or sells something thinking it is worth exactly the price tag. You only buy something because you think that product is worth more to you than the amount of money you have. Likewise, the seller only sells something because they think that the thing is worth less than the money they are going to get. That way, the moment you make an exchange, both of you end up with a greater value. Wealth was created in a simple exchange. Of course, some decisions are wrong. You can buy something and later realize it is not worth what you thought. You can invest your money in something that doesn't give you the expected return. Yes, wrong decisions exist and they destroy wealth. But people's intention is always to increase value and that's what happens most of the time. Additionally, sometimes people buy things that help them gain even more wealth. You can buy a car that adds a value for you, a car that simply gives you more comfort when traveling. This is wealth creation already. But it could be that you buy a car for Uber driving, for example. A situation in which you are generating wealth not just at the time of the purchase, but through countless additional interactions you will have with your customers over the course of a significant time. That good became a factor of production. Having wealth creates more wealth. The better decisions you make, the more you improve your situation, and also the total amount of wealth in the world. Every time someone trades, the whole world wins. Furthermore, the division of labor is extremely important for wealth generation. Human beings are much more productive when they specialize in one thing, one profession, one task only. If you needed to produce all the food you consume, that would be extremely laborious. In fact, even trivial things like a pencil have many production steps and would simply be impossible to produce by a person alone. Have you already seen the Milton Friedman video? But since there are people who specialize in cutting wood, others in mining graphite, and so on, we can buy a pencil in exchange for a little bit of our work in the profession we choose. This way, whenever a decision separates work, dividing a task into smaller tasks, it generates wealth. People working on a more specialized task are able to produce more, generating wealth for everyone. It is important to note that, contrary to what many socialists, communists, and envious people in general think, the economy is not a zero-sum game. For someone to be rich, it is not necessary that someone else be poor. A mere trade generates wealth. The rich are usually those who have made good trading decisions through their lifetime. Of course, this rule is not absolute. Many are rich because they inherited wealth from their parents. And that's legitimate, because it is the parents' right to donate their wealth to whomever they want, usually their children. 
Inheritance is not a son's right, inheritance is a parent's right, who as the legitimate owners of something have the right to make donations upon the occasion of their deaths. But even among those who inherit, there are many who have destroyed all their heritage with bad decisions, and there are also examples of people who multiply their inherited wealth with good decisions. Surely, there are also people who acquire wealth through illicit means, thieves, kidnappers, swindlers, politicians, friends of politicians. All of these fall into this category. They got rich at the expense of others, using violence. These people's properties are illegitimate, as well as the properties of their heirs. But it's very important to note that it's no general rule that if you are rich, it's because you stole wealth from others. There is no such thing. It is perfectly possible to be rich, a millionaire even, only with good, legitimate decisions. The economy is clear about this. Those who are rich may have stolen things, and if there is evidence of this, it can always be taken to a private court. But remember, this is not the rule, this is the exception. Easily identifiable by the close relationship with the biggest criminal gang there is, the government. Then, does all that mean that those who are poor are guilty of their own poverty? Are people poor only because they have made wrong decisions in life? No, not at all. You don't need to make any decision to be poor. Poverty is the human's original condition. Nobody is entitled to any wealth just by being born. At birth, we are all poor. Little naked monkeys, whiners and poopers that have absolutely nothing but small bodies that without help from others wouldn't even survive. Fortunately for most of us, our parents and relatives take care of us out of charity until the age when we can begin to make our own decisions. Those with rich parents may have more initial material comfort. Those with caring parents probably earn even more than that. But the fact is that at the beginning we are all poor. We need to make decisions, participate in society, buy, produce, sell, in order to generate wealth. The poor are not guilty of being poor because that is the original nature of life. But they can choose to improve their lives just by making good decisions. Poor people are poor usually because they decide little. They do few deals. Yes, making decisions is difficult. We may in fact never really learn it. But one fact is undeniable. The more you make your own decisions, the more you sell and buy, the more you learn. Inevitably, some of the decisions you make are bad, but it is in these that you learn and over time improve your decision-making process. Of course, there are also many things that influence people to make certain decisions. It would be unrealistic to think that we can always make good decisions based solely on our deductive and inductive reasoning about products' marginal values. Yes, psychology is an important part of choosing. Some socialists even talk about the commodity fetish. Propaganda hijacks us into making bad decisions. We buy things we don't need because we are influenced by ads. With these wrong decisions, big corporations make easy money, and we lose it. Yes, there is some truth there. The main wrong decision that many people make based on false propaganda is to think that the government is good for something, for example. Damn misleading propaganda, clearly based on the human psyche, that thinks a benevolent parent can fix everything for you. Unfortunately, such an idealized father does not exist, and thinking that the government is such a father only generates bad decisions at various levels and enslaves many people. But even ads of simple products such as soft drinks and cars may influence people to make bad decisions. It's funny to see those beer ads showing a lot of beautiful people in shape, whereas when you go drink at a bar, you see only fat, ugly people. But this is something important to note. Nobody is forcing you to do anything. The decision remains yours and yours alone. It is only up to the individual to perceive the limit between marginal utility and pure emotional appeal. In principle, advertising is not bad. It informs us of the features of the products we may wish to purchase. It is helpful to know that such a product exists, that it has such features. 
From there, what you do with this information is your responsibility. If you already know that ads should be taken with skepticism, you have nothing to worry about. Yes, I'm aware that there are several techniques, which some say are even unconscious and emotional, to get you to buy something. But any adult who has been through the ordeals of life knows how to hold on to money and avoid such pitfalls. Much worse are the state's threats of the use of violence. But it is important to note that it is precisely when trying to solve problems that the state emphasizes them most. You already understand that bad decisions can lead to bad situations. If you take a low-paying job, it can make you miserable. Then the government makes a decision for you. It prohibits you from taking a job for less than a set amount of dollars by using minimum wage. However, this is bad for the economy for two reasons. It's bad because if you can't generate value above the minimum wage, you simply won't get a job. But more than that, without being able to choose, you are less likely to learn from your choices. So the nanny government limits the decisions we can or cannot make as the parasitic bureaucrat thinks is best for you. This is a tragedy. People become less and less able to decide about their own lives. Without making decisions, without making exchanges, without trading, these people are doomed to the original state of poverty. Those who were born poor are condemned to be poor for their whole lives. No one in the world knows what's better for you, better than yourself. You may make wrong decisions, but surely any decision made by a bureaucrat is worse than your worst decisions. Thank you for your audience. This article was originally written by Peter Turguniev, translated by Cabeça Livre, revised and narrated by Arthur Silvani. If you like this video, please hit the thumbs up icon below and share the video in your social network. If you want to be notified of other videos, hit subscribe and then the bell icon. See you soon!